You know, what you're really describing is a cult. Mm-hmm. And, 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 and I'm wondering what, what keeps the Kim family dynasty, the Kim cult in, in, in charge? I mean, how can they maintain control of 26 million people in these <laughs> conditions? I mean, are they facilitated? So many factors work to, in order for this to maintain, right? Keep the status quo. First is the political support they get from China. China's support has been most important factor for the regime to survive. They've been providing the oil, all the materials the North Korea needs to build the nukes and be antagonistic to South Korea, Japan, and America. So that Chinese support is there. The second support is coming from the North Korean ruling elite. North Korean regime divided people into 51 different castes. The same people, same genetics, but they divided people into 51 classes. And that's the dictator's handbook. You divide and rule. When you separate people, when you separate families, people are vulnerable. You cannot rely on each other. So people are against each other in North Korea. And then on top of all this suffering, there's one top elite that is ruling the nation. So they are supporting this regime. They have the every reason, every right, and every intention to maintain Kim Jong-un's status quo so they can be the royalty in the 21st century. And another thing they use is that fear. They do not accept any, um, any like resistance. There's no such a thing called a dissent in North Korea. You hear the dissent in Cuba, Iran, China, other countries, but there's no way you can be a dissent in North Korea because as soon as you do go against the regime, they kill up to three to eight generations. The first thing that my mother told me as a young girl was, don't even whisper because the birds and mice could hear me. And if I said one wrong word, it was not going to just kill me. It was going to kill up to three to eight generations of my family. So that zero tolerance rule keeps everybody afraid and they cannot fight back because the, the revenge is from the regime is brutal. It's not the, something we ever see in any other nation before. And I think these forces helping regime to continue and it will probably continue as long as the free world continue to silence about this crisis. Yonbi, you gave a, uh, a speech in Dublin, Ireland, and, mm-hmm. and, and some one billion people, I mean, that's an astounding number. Uh, one billion people globally have seen that speech. And as a result of that, you have a, a, a pretty significant level of fame and fortune. Um, you could luxuriate in that fame and fortune, and yet you have put yourself on the firing line by criticizing China, by criticizing uh, the dictatorship in North Korea. Why would you do that? You, you, you escape from North Korea via China. You experience sexual slavery. You cross the Gobi Desert into Mongolia, transported from Mongolia to South Korea. Then you become an American citizen You go through all of the hell that you went through in your life. I think you're 30 years old now. Uh, So you're a young woman. You've written bestsellers. you're, You're known by the elite of America. And yet you have chosen a hard path. Why? Um, when you survive something like that, um, so there are only 100, 209 of us made it to America over the last 80 years. From say, the, say that number again. Yeah, only, 209. Only 209. Made it to America over the last 80 years. Wow. Yeah, so uh, you do have some kind of survivor's gift because I know truly in my heart that I didn't get – this lucky because I was somehow fought harder than other people. I got simply lucky or I got chosen. And I think that it comes with the responsibility. World has no clue what's happening inside North Korea. They have no clue what's happening to North Korean women in China. 
they don't know the North Korean girls organs are harvested out of them in the 21st century. They don't know that my mother, like people like me were sold for $65 or $20 in the 21st century. In the, in the 21st century, people have no clue that slavery never ended. It's been continuing and the numbers has been growing than ever before. So I think it, it came with that responsibility and uh, I guess it's one way for me to cope with my survivor scared that by being the voice for this voice of less voiceless people, I, I do feel less guilty and it's the only right thing to do. I remember when I was crossing the desert, uh, the biggest fear that I felt was not even dying. It's, it's a, the point, like the fact that nobody knew that I existed that nobody knew the struggles the North Korean people going through. If I died in that desert that night, nobody would have known what any of this happened to North Korean people. To 26 millions of people are going through this nightmare. And because I got out somehow with luck or with somehow supernatural power or helping me, I got this position. So I could not be silenced again when I was seeing this rise of authoritarianism in America that this guy's in the name of compassion, name of equity, equality of outcomes, the same promise that Kim Il-sung promised to people is being believed by the American people, especially by the American young uh, college-educated people, believing that somehow the paradise is possible on earth, that utopia is like possible, that we can achieve that dream of where nobody is suffering, nobody is unequal, we, are, we can be all the same. That deadly promise is happening in America. And I cannot see this time again that seeing America that I love becoming like North Korea. I was uh, diagnosed with stage four mental cell lymphoma, a very serious form of cancer in 2017. And mm. uh, I survived that um, through a transplant in 2019. And, and sometimes I tell people I feel like I'm living on borrowed time. And when I read your mm -hmm. book, that was one of the phrases that caught my attention. You point out that you feel like you're living on borrowed time. Now, I'm 73 years old. You're, I, I guess it's impolite to say your, na your, your age, but yeah. you say it in your book. So you're, you're about 30 yeah. years of age. Uh -huh. uh, so you're, you're, you're a young, beautiful woman. You're a mother, and you say you're living on borrowed time. Explain that. Uh, I, I mean, as I said, the number indicates completely, you know, that only 29 of us made it here. Hmm. It's in a way after you, when you, get this lucky <laughs> you're like, and it mathematically makes no sense and i'm like not even 80 pounds with a one percentile of you know strength in body and make this far it's a you know it's, it is a bonus life at this point it's a it's not something that i earned it was given by greater force that i I get to enjoy or i was given to so i try to make the count and make that meaningful in any way I can. And in a way or so that I've been on a killing list of Kim Jong-un for a while. <laughs> I've been informed by South Korean intelligence long time ago that I was just on his killing list. So I can be killed any day, any second, anywhere I go if he decides because the most powerful dictator is going against me. There's no way, no intelligence can stop that assassination if Kim Jong-un wants to do it. Like he killed his own half brother in Malaysia in the international airport. There's nothing this dictator wouldn't do. He doesn't care about the human rights or international shame. He has no shame in, in him. So for me, it's that every day is a blessing that I do not, I cannot take, that, take it for granted. You tell a remarkable story of being at Columbia University. This is a university that's older than the uh, United States of America that we know of. Yeah. And yet, when you went to orientation day, I, I think you almost had deja vu of being back in North Korea. Completely. It was unbelievable. I could not believe in the center of the world, that is New York City, in one of these amazing Ivy League schools with a great reputation I go to, and seeing the indoctrination that was happening, 
this completely just pure propaganda that was uh, pumping out the students, really. They are saying that all the evils of the world, all the problems in the world is because of the white men. They are the source of every evil that we have in the world. The only solution for us to solve all these problems, to solve all these injustices in the world is by destroying America, by destroying the constitution. And we build this nation in the image of, in the name of equity, which is collectivism and socialism. And this was being taught in one of the most elite schools in the whole world, really. And that's when I was realizing that, after all, America was not on the right path. It was, you know, horrible in the wrong path that we are choosing to go. And I was really even wondering how many people even know this. And no wonder these kids graduating from Colombia become the higher position in the society. They become the former president. They become the ones to running the big tech companies, big big banks or any biggest in- institution. And they become, they believe this, this authoritarian mindset where if somebody disagrees with you, you have every right to silence them. And that is happening all around America now, and especially during the pandemic, I saw that from my first eyes. And it, we we don't have that much time left in this country to turn this back. Yeah, it, it, while time remains, we don't have that much time. I mean, these kinds of revolutions, uh, w- which have been taking place gradually in the environmental industry, in the educational industry, uh, in the entertainment industry, these kinds of revolutions, they, 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 they seem to be very gradual. And we, we may look at it as Americans and say, well, we still have a lot of time. I mean, a lot's going wrong, but, you know, we, we, we've got time. But when you look at some of the revolutions, like the French Revolution or the Bolshevik Revolution, suddenly you have catastrophe. And so you're warning people, freedom is fragile. Be aware be involved. You can't do a whole lot about what's going on, uh, you know, in the totality of American government, but you can be involved on a local level. You can be involved um, in, 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 in making a difference, to use your title, while time remains. Yeah, exactly. That's what I convey in my new book is about how to really recognize the threat that is causing to our liberty but also what to do about it. it. Changing the world does not begin with, you know, the greatest world that we can begin. It really starts from self-government. You know, you start from being at home, for establishing your family, you taking care of your community, and you go out in the local governments and vote and say your opinions in your company or at school anywhere. So it really not being fearful. The, reason that I wrote that book is that people think that somehow revolution only can happen when everybody in the society agrees. But in the human history, if you look at it, it's only in the hot spots. It's like even Kim Il-sung, when he came, there are plenty of people did not approve, approve what he was doing. But he was attracting these hot spots of institutions that would support him. And by now, look at us. The Hollywood is completely embedded with China. With the, with the work corporations, with all these big tech companies, even so much American, like even FBI, I was canceled by FBI. I couldn't believe it. This niche, this is a government agency dedicated to protect American citizens. And because of that, I did not believe that men can be a woman. They said they cannot have me and telling them about what to do about North Korea. So while I was writing this book, uh, I was invited to speak at FBI and talk about the, the, the harrowing journeys that North Korea even go through in China to become free. And then like literally two days before my uh, speech, the head of diversity calls me and saying, because of my political views, they cannot have me as a speaker. They had to cancel the event. And that same year that I became American citizen and in my American citizenship, an uh, interviewer asked me, have you ever persecuted anybody for their political opinion? If you have, you know that you cannot become American. You cannot persecute somebody for their political opinion. That is a very not American thing to do. People have no clue what it means to be American or running America. And that's why America is not the same America anymore. 
So really, I, I think us to find that the original principles, what was the basic principles of this country and reading what the, our founding fathers intended to become a free person and free nation that lets people be free from the government's tyranny. I think that's a really first step for us to understand and go back to the first principles and stop being on TikTok and social media. <laughs> wow. So you're saying that if you are on social media, if you watch the news cycle all the time, um, you're probably not going to get a true valuation of things. And one of the things I love about you is that you are a learning machine. You actually got that nickname in South Korea. One, one year, I don't know when, what year it was, or if you do this every year, but this is a woman after my own heart. I mean, you said you read 100 books, and I'm yeah. constantly telling people to read. Mm -hmm. Maybe from your perspective, you can put an exclamation point on how important it is to be a learning machine, to read and not be obsessed with the narratives that you hear in the popular media. Yeah, it's a, it's a very tempting thing, you know, when you read a few, few words on Twitter or even Instagram, and there's no even words on Instagram. I don't do use TikTok personally, but even going on TikTok, it really changes your brain chemicals that you cannot really pay attention that much. It doesn't engage your brain. You're just a passively receiving this in information that is made by somebody who was very not educated a lot of times. And I think this is why America is losing in this competition with the Asia that we are talking about in South Korea, right? Like uh, the greatest knowledge was in classical books that built this nation, that we can go back to the, reading the law by Bastia. We can read so many amazing books like On Liberty by John Stuart Mill or, you know, 1984. There are so many amazing books to explain how the authoritarianism works what it means to be a free person, what it means to live in a free country, understanding the threat of even a majority, how majority can be wrong a lot of times and can choose a tyranny come to that country. People don't understand this. And then there's like, oh, as long as more people want it, that's a great thing. Like, how do you know that's a good thing? And so many times the, when you get into this group think, people make a bad, horrible decisions every single time. When we join this group think, it produces death of millions of poor humanity. So I think for us to really going back to those classical books to understand our nature, human nature, the political structure that we are living in and the past histories. And I think that is the only way to us to overcome the, the noise that is making by the Hollywood and TikTok and social media that is not doing any good to anybody. Really children getting affected. And even adult, they're, we are getting more oppressed, I mean, depressed and isolated from each other. And I, it's like, as a parent, I, I'm like, there's no way my child is going to ever, ever get on social media. As long as this child is under my roof, that will never happen. So are you going to make sure he doesn't get a phone? I think eventually he needs to get a smartphone, but it's going to be heavily monitored and child locked. And when he gets home, it's getting locked. I'm never going to let him have his phone in his own room by himself. <laughs> Good for you.